Thanks for watching today. I pray the message you're about to hear will empower you to use your voice, help change the way you think, and refresh your spirit. If you'd like to follow along with Pastor's Notes, you can find them on the on-demand page of walkingbyfaith.tv or on our app. Today we're starting a new series called Valleys and Peaks. We're talking about the trials, temptations, and deserts that we all go through. Even the Bible tells us that following Jesus and doing His works isn't going to be easy. It does say the reward will be grand. Pastor Duane is really unpacking the truth in today's message, Endurance. But today I want to start a series of messages, and I don't know how many I'm going to do. Um, you know, I never finish anything, so we'll just see how far we get. But I want to talk to you about temptations, trials, tests, and deserts. Temptations, trials, deaths, tests, and deserts. Well, let me just first of all say that we all go through them. Everybody goes, how I many know Jesus was tempted? Jesus spent 40 days in the desert being tempted by the devil. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, it says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. How many have been through various? Not just one. That the genuine, genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what, what he's saying is when we come through these tests and trials, there's going to be an eternal reward for us. And I just want to say that Jesus never promised us that life would be without tests and trials and deserts and temptations. In fact, in Jesus finishes his sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, literally the greatest sermon that was ever been preached. He ends with this, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains descend, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against the house and it didn't fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains descend, the floods came, the winds blew and beat out that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now notice Jesus is saying, if you're a hearer and a doer, or if you're not a doer of the word, there's going to be floods, there's gonna be rains, there's gonna be winds. Nobody gets through life without tests and trials. In fact, Jesus said, there's going to be storms that come in your life. He said, but if you build your life on his word and doing his word, he said, you will come through the storm. In Proverbs 10, in verse 29, um, you know, I get to talk to you every week, but Jeannie talks to me every day. Uh, and, and this is one of the, the verses that she kind of brought out to me several years ago. It's in Proverbs 10, verse 29. It says, the way of the Lord is strength, to the upright. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright. What that means is this. Jeannie said, when, when uh, you do something God's way, he says, it will strengthen you. It will bless you. You know, when you forgive other people, I mean, no, that's God's way. You bless them. And when you do, the Bible says that you get set free and you break the cycle of doing evil for evil. So when you do it God's way, it strengthens you and it blesses your life. Uh, the Bible talks about sowing into the kingdom of God. But when, and when we do it, our faith grows. The Bible tells us that we literally get fruit to our account. There's an eternal reward and God blesses us. When you, when you go to church, you know, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner or custom of some. But when you do, you get encouraged and you encourage other people. When we do our work is unto the Lord, God blesses us, God strengthens us, and in the Bible says that we are glorifying God when we do it. When we get a nudge from the Spirit of God and we obey that nudge, we do it God's way, we become more sensitive to the things of God, we make better decisions, and it pleases God and God blesses us as a result. You know, when a temptation comes, how many have ever been tempted? 
When a temptation comes and we resist that temptation with the word of God and we stand strong against that thing. The Bible tells you you're so, the Bible, the devil tells you you're so weak. But the truth is when you stand against it, even though you feel weak, you become stronger and you get free. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright. When you do it God's way, it will strengthen you and it will bless you. In Psalms 105, it's talking about Joseph. Now, Joseph has been sold by his brothers to some slave traders, and they're taking him down to Egypt. And it says, he, God, sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters, and he was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord, it tested him. So literally, he went through a test. He went through a time where his faith was proven, and as a result of that, God brings him to a tremendous place of influence and promotion. The circumstances in our life, our attitudes, our faith, our love, serving God in the midst of whatever situation that we're in, it causes us to become stronger. It is strength to the upright. Now, I wanted to talk about something this morning that seldom gets talked about in church today. And I want to talk to you about suffering. But I want to talk to you about what the Bible says about suffering. Now, when the, the disciples are preaching the gospel and the, the uh, leaders literally rebuke him, it says they departed from, their, from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now, notice they're rejoicing that they're counted worthy to suffer for Jesus' name. Now, we are supposed to suffer for the kingdom of God, for righteousness' sake, and for his name's sake. There's supposed to be a suffering that goes along with being a Christian. The Bible says all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I got one kind of like, may have really? <laughs> You're like, you don't like that verse. All right. Somebody says, well, I've just never had any trouble with the devil at all. Well, it's probably because you're going in the same direction. <laughs> See, because when you, when you start moving in the opposite direction, the Bible says there will be opposition. The Bible says we will suffer for righteousness' sake. Now, Matthew 5, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. Now, Jesus is talking about how when we suffer for his name's sake, for the kingdom's sake, for righteousness' sake, he said, you're blessed. You are blessed. He said, and so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. I remember when Jeannie and I, we were married, and our, our first, by the time we were married one year, we were living in Mexico. Uh, we celebrated our first anniversary. In fact, when, when we left from Mexico, I was 22, and Jeannie was 20. I, I turned 23 on our way down. So we were, we were just kids. Um, in a very short time, we were pastoring a church in about six weeks. And uh, we had been there about six months. And at that time, it was technically illegal to be a missionary in Mexico. And you, could, you had to go in on tourist papers. So every 180 days, you had to leave. And so uh, we left. Now, before we left, I knew that there was a, a, a man in the congregation who'd, who'd come in. And uh, I knew by the, by the Spirit of God that he was troubled. In fact, before I left, I said to a couple of the leaders, I said to Guatemoc and Rogelio, I said, now look, do not let this guy preach. Do not do it. I said, in fact, Rogelio, you preach this night. Guatemoc, you preach this night. And I said, Rogelio, uh, you, you over here, I want you on, on Thursday night. And uh, when we were gone, the first, the first night we were gone, he came in and said, God said I was supposed to preach. Well, we were gone for 10 days. 
And during that time, he split the church. And I remember we got back, and we had about 120, almost all university students in our, in our church at that time. And when we got back, half of them had, had left. And uh, I remember going from door to door, visiting, talking to people. And I remember being spit at, being cussed out. Uh, they slit the tires on my car, you know. And, but I remember this one particular door I, I, I knocked on, and, and, and they, they, they spit at me, and they said, you, you American devil. And, and, um, and I remember going out to the car, and I just put my hand on the steering wheel, and I just, I just broke down. And I said, God, I am the worst pastor that you've ever had. I said, in six months, I've lost half the people. I said, and, and, and I can't do this anymore. I just cannot do this anymore. And I'm, I'm crying. And this verse, you ever have verses bother you? This verse just kind of floated up. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. And great is your reward in heaven. And I remember thinking, oh. <laughs> it, it, it was like, this isn't even helping. But the Bible tells us, look, that they rejoiced that they were counted worthy. They were counted worthy. In Hebrews 10, you know, we tend to think about faith as, as something where we just receive from God. But Hebrews 11 is the great faith chapter. And this is what it says. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mocking and scourging, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these having attained a good testimony through faith. Obtained a good testimony through faith. You know, they please God. And according to Jesus, right, they're, they're blessed. They're happy. They're to be envied. Having obtained a good faith through faith, they did not receive the promise. Now, the promise it's talking about is the promise of the kingdom of God. The Bible says this very chapter, Hebrews 11, that Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So they didn't receive everything, right? Because Jesus hasn't come back yet to redeem us, spirit, soul, and body. God, God having provided something better for us that we should not be made perfect apart from them. Because when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. So, but these people were living by faith, right? But they were, they, they, they were persecuted, many of them. Uh, the Bible says they're, they're wandering about. They're just dressed in, in sheepskins. They're living in caves, but they obtained a good report because what they did, they did for the kingdom of God. They did it for righteousness sake. And faith is not just receiving something from God, but by faith, you might be rejected. By faith, listen, there's people who by faith have it made in the States and move to a third world country for the kingdom of God's sake so they can preach the gospel. How I many you know that's pleasing to God? You are to be, you're going to be persecuted if you live godly in Christ Jesus. You, know, you can give up something for the gospel. Those are things that are pleasing to God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 says, For this is commendable, if because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, it's commendable before God if you do the right thing and you're rejected or you suffer for doing the right thing. For what credit is it if when you're beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So you do the right thing and you suffer for it and it is commendable, it pleases God. Now here's the part nobody likes. 
for to this you were called. What are we called to do? We're called to do the right thing, to do righteousness, and then have people reject it and reject you as a result. And the Bible says, to this we're called. Listen, the world is never going to understand what God has placed on the inside of you. The world never understands the kingdom of God. In fact, Jesus said to uh, Nicodemus, he said, except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see it, you don't understand it, and you reject it. So that's what it's saying. He said, but when you suffer for doing the right thing, it is commendable. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. So we are called to do righteousness, to do the right thing, and to suffer for it. Uh, Just in the last couple of weeks, probably many of you know that in Canada, they passed a law that's entitled C4. C4. Um, It has to do with conversion therapy. Let me just give you a couple of things that it means. So conversion therapy is changing a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual. Change the person's gender gender identity to your SIG identity. Your SIG identity is the identity you're born with. So you were born, and on your birth certificate, it says you're a male or you're a female. So if you try to get somebody to say, "I, I don't feel like a male, but try to get them to say, I am a male or to live like a male, you've just broken the law. Change a person's gender expression so that it conforms to the sex assigned them to that person at birth. So you can't help a person who was was born a male say, I'm a male. Repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior. Repress a person's non-seg identity. So if you're saying anything that would cause a person who is having gender dysphoria, if you say anything that would cause them to act towards their born gender, you've broken the law and possibly could serve five years in prison. Now, that didn't happen in Russia. That happened in Canada. So, so literally, to preach from Genesis 1, 27, which said God created man in his own image, and in his own image, he created them male and female. To preach on that, you can go to jail for five years. Now, we don't have that law in America, but if we did, we need a good prison ministry. <laughs> we're, not cha- we're not changing the, 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 the culture changes the word of God. It lives and it abides for forever. It's truth. It is truth. But when you live in a society that no longer believes that your rights were given to you by God, but are given to you by a government, the government can do anything that it wants to do. Um, just in the last 10 days, uh, I, I had a phone call and a person was saying, I, I have a, a relative who's having issues concerning their gender. He said, but they say, Jesus didn't say anything at all about homosexuality. And, and I said, well, in one sense, that's true. He, he did deal with unclean spirits which are sexually perverse spirits. I said, but it's not just what Jesus said that's the word of God. The whole Bible is the word of God. The whole Bible is the word of God. All scripture is God-breathed. It's God-inspired, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, to teach us how to live right, (laughs) the message Bible says. So I simply quoted to him 1 Corinthians 9, which says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor, excuse me, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor coveters, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. See, we, we cannot take culture stand on issues that are kingdom of God issues. There are issues, they're not political. Now, now, politics may try to get in on them, right? but they're not political issues. 
They're kingdom of God issues. And by the way, the, the, the Bible is not here really, I can say this, it's not selecting one sin and saying that this particular one is worse than all the others. Notice it's fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. We love, how many of you know you love every single person on this planet? But that does not mean that you say whatever you do is fine. Because we have a culture that tries to tell us, don't stand up for righteousness. But Jesus says, stand up for righteousness and suffer for righteousness' sake, for the kingdom of God's sake. So, so we need to recognize that faith is not just about receiving from God. There's times where by faith you suffer for righteousness' sake, for the kingdom of God's sake, for his name's sake. Now, whenever, whatever the test, the trial is, whatever it is, remember this, you are not alone. You're not alone. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, when you go through something, we may think I'm the only one, but the Bible is telling us you are not alone because your brotherhood, which is the kingdom of God, all Christians are going through something that's similar. And when we get that attitude, I'm the only one, woe is me. Now, in the Old Testament, we have the prophet Elijah, and he gets, he, he gets like flaky. Elisha gets kind of, he gets kind of flaky. And the, the, the wicked queen Jezebel is after him. And he runs away and he said, God, I'm alone and I'm the only one that's left and they're trying to take my life. And he said, God, I'm no better than anybody else. God, just kill me. So he's having a pity party because he thinks he's all alone. And he literally gets suicidal. He said, God, just kill me. I just want to die. I'm the only one. And God says to him, but pretty much slapped his face and says, look, he says, I have 7,000 people in Israel that have not bowed the name. He said, he says, you are not alone and we're not alone. You might think you're the only one. You're not the only one. But besides that, Romans 8 says this, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it's written, for your sake, we're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. No matter what you're going through, you are not alone. God is with you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I've said this before, but I just want to say it again. When the Bible says leave, it means physically leave you. But when it says forsake you, it means he won't turn his heart away from you. You may think God's mad, God's upset, but he's not. He said, I'll never leave you and I will never turn my heart away from you. Doesn't matter what you feel. Feelings come and feelings go. And especially you know, we're living in the world where Jesus said the prince of this world, speaking of the devil, He's going to come and he's going to try to condemn you. One of the devil's names in the Bible is the accuser of the brethren. He will always come and accuse you. So Jesus said to his disciples, John 14, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Now, listen, we are living in a society which exalts feelings above anything. Right? Well, I feel and I feel and I think. But Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. See, see, here's what Jesus said. Do not let feelings rule your life. Do not let feelings dominate your life. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Now, for you to not let your heart be troubled, uh, there's a couple of things. One of the things is what you're thinking about. But so, so, so extremely important is what you say to yourself. Even quiet people are talking all the time. 
but they're just talking to themselves. And by the way, it is scriptural to talk to yourself. It's in the Bible. All right? David said to his soul, he said, don't be distressed. He's talking to himself. Soul, why are you disquieted within me? He's talking to himself. All right. So if somebody says to you, you're weird talking to yourself, just tell them, no, you're weird. The Bible tells me I can talk to myself. All right. But your self-talk, it is extremely important. What you're saying to yourself. In 1 John 3, verse 19, it says this. By this we know that we're of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. And shall assure our hearts before him. So you have got to assure your heart. You got to be talking to your heart. And, and by the way, your heart is a combination of your soul or your mind and your spirit. The heart is the combination of the two. So you got to be talking to yourself, but you got to be saying the right things when you're talking to yourself. Some people are talking to themselves and they say, well, I never get a break and I always blow it and I could never lose weight and I'll never get out of debt and I'll never be able to break this addiction and I'll never succeed and I'll never get a promotion and nothing ever works out for me. Well, that's the wrong kind of talking. If that's what you're saying, you are not assuring your heart. The Bible says that the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. So you and I need to acknowledge every good thing that we have in Christ. So literally, when Jesus defeated the devil, arose from the dead, and took his seat at God's right hand, everything that he did, he did not do for himself. He did for you, and he did it for me. He didn't need to whip the devil himself, but he did it for us. In the Bible, when you become a Christian, the words that are often used are in Christ. You're in Christ. Because he didn't do it for himself, he did it for you. And in God's eyes, he took you with him. The apostle Paul said, my old man was crucified with Christ. Now, he wasn't saying that his dad was one of the two thieves. What he was, listen, listen, what he was saying is the person that I used to be before Christ, Jesus took to the cross. And that person died with Christ on the cross. And that person was buried with Christ. And that person was raised with Christ. And that person is seated with Christ in heavenly places, Ephesians says, far above principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in the world that is to come. And we need to begin to say who we are in Christ. You need to acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ. Well, what does he say? He says he'll always lead you in triumph in Christ. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You see, you're delivered from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. You are a new creature in Christ. The Bible tells us that if anyone is in Christ, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new and all these things are of God. See, you're in Christ. You're in union with him. In Christ, healing belongs to you. In Christ, the Bible says that he'll always lead you in victory. In Christ, there is a breakthrough for you. The Bible says you will be a overcomer in Christ. See, we begin to confess who we are in Christ, right? And when we do that, we assure our hearts. And we begin to talk to ourselves. And we begin to tell ourselves who we are in Christ. Now, listen, I'm going to just close with this. There is a confession of faith, but there is a confession unto faith. In other words, the first time you say who you are in Christ, 
it may not register right away. It may take a while. But the Bible says that with the heart, man believes. With the heart, man believes. So everything we ever receive from God, we receive as a result of faith. And it happens down on the inside first. So often we're looking for the outside. We're looking for a feeling. We're looking for a manifestation. We're looking for something on the outside, but it always happens on the inside first. With the heart, man believes. So when we begin to confess who we are in Christ, literally we're schooling ourselves. We're teaching our heart who we are. And there may be a time where you literally, you're coming to the place where you believe it, but you keep confessing what God says about you and the day will come. It will not be a confession unto faith. It will be a confession of faith. And the Bible tells us the way that our faith literally becomes supercharged is by acknowledging every good thing that we have in Christ Jesus. And so many Christians never experience victory because they never make a bold statement about who they are in Christ. But we need to assure our hearts. We need to confess who we are in Christ. Say, today, if you realize in your heart you're not right with God, you're away from the Lord, and you say, I want to be right with God, let me tell you the two things God wants from you. He wants you to receive the forgiveness that he offers you, and he wants you to surrender your life to Jesus. And I'd like you to pray a prayer with me right now to receive that forgiveness and to surrender your life to Jesus. And when we say amen, you're going to be right with God. Just make these words your own. Just say, oh God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. I believe he rose again. And I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I'm going to live for him every day. Now, thank you. You've heard my prayer that I'm forgiven that I'm your child, a part of your family, today and forever, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you prayed that simple prayer from your heart, you are right with God. You're forgiven, you're a part of his family, on your way to heaven. And I wanna help you keep growing spiritually. And because of that, the desire, I wrote a book full of bullet points to help you keep growing spiritually, and I wanna give it to you free of charge. Uh, all you need to do is get online, download the book, Your New Life. It's going to bless you and help you keep on growing in Jesus. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life, and we are so excited for you. Just as Pastor said, we'd love to send you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. Log on to walkingbyfaith.tv and have it mailed to you, Download it right there instantly, or you can find it on our app. It's absolutely free and a great resource for you to have. Walking by Faith is used on and off the air to change lives all around the world. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider becoming a partner with us. You can now text WBF Give to 1 888 364 G I V E. Visit walkingbyfaith.tv slash give or click on the giving icon in our app. Find us on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and on your favorite social platform by searching WBF TV. Also, check out our app in your favorite app store. You can download past sermons, follow along with notes, speak confessions over your life, and so much more. Psalm 23.4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. I pray this verse comes to mind when you're going through your valleys.